Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Corumbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today as usual. And Jim, we start with good news about just how fake the Hillary Clinton presidential campaign is. This version of the story comes to us from the UK Daily Mail. Hillary Clinton's AstroTurf candidacy is in full swing. Her Tuesday morning visit to a coffee shop in LeClaire, Iowa, was staged from beginning to end, according to Austin Byrd, one of the men pictured sitting at the table with Mrs. Clinton. Byrd told Daily Mail Online that campaign staffer Troy Price called and asked him and two other young people to meet him Tuesday morning at a restaurant in Davenport, a nearby city. Price then drove them to the coffee house to meet Clinton after vetting them for about half an hour. The three got the lion's share of Mrs. Clinton's time and participated in what breathless news reports described as a roundtable the first of many in her brief Iowa campaign swing. But these three people were not in any way randomly selected. Byrd is a frequent participant in Iowa Democratic Party events. He interned with President Obama's re-election campaign and was tapped to chauffeur Vice President Biden in October 2014 when he visited Iowa. The other two people were University of Iowa College Democrats President Carter Bell and Planned Parenthood of the Heartland employee Sarah Sedlasek, I think is how you say it. So, Jim, they were uh, handpicked, they were vetted, they were specifically driven to the event for this random encounter with Mrs. Clinton, who, of course, plays it off so naturally that even the folks here at MSNBC are uh, wringing their hands about it. Here's uh, here's Mika Brzezinski, first of all. I like the idea of a low-key approach. I like the idea of going and listening to people. But I think she knows what her policies and her standing is on issues. And I, th- I think that... It seems a little canned at this point. And here's Mike Barnacle worrying about Hillary being ready for a real campaign. Her larger problem, I think, is, and you can see it in just what we saw this morning, she has basically been living in a in a protective cocoon for 30 years. She's she needs a primary to get in shape. She needs a spring training version of presidential primary. So the liberals already wringing their hands about a a clunky, obviously phony rollout here, Jim. I don't think we could be happier than to hear stuff like that. Probably the simplest and easiest way of describing this is to observe that you only do this in which you have your hand-picked people who you know are going to ask friendly questions and not really press her on anything and nod and smile and just be overjoyed to be in the presence of the queen in a circumstance like this, is if you're terrified of her meeting actual voters. This is the... The people around Hillary conceding that as long as there is script, she's fine. But the moment things are unscripted, things can go wrong. (laughs) This is campaigning scared, right? This this is campaigning with fear in your heart because if, if, heaven forbid, somebody asks her, you know, so why did you delete the emails? Or why is your foundation still taking donations from foreign governments? Or what happened in Benghazi? Or, Or what did you do as secretary? You traveled a lot, but what did you get for all that? It basically saying as long as she doesn't have contact with actual voters who don't already like her, she'll be fine. <laughs> and that's really not how you run for office. And the folks at MSNBC have good reason to be concerned because this is, I, I don't know if we've ever seen, we, we've seen tightly scripted candidates and candidates who don't like to have contact with the media. And, you know, there have been times, I remember the first time Christie ran in 2009, he didn't do a lot of access. They don't like to do a lot of interviews, but I don't know if we've ever seen it this scale for the president of the United States. And I think you just can't do it. And, um, you know, the the simplest answer, you know, if you change the perception of something, you have to change the reality of something. If you want to change the perception that Hillary can't handle interacting with real people, you know what you do? You have her interact with real people. (laughs) And if it goes wrong, it goes wrong. And then you just got to get better at it. So there you go. All right. On to the bad martini now, Jim. And every major political issue had to take a break yesterday afternoon because a 61-year-old Florida mailman landed what we probably most of us have never heard of before, a gyrocopter on the west lawn of the Capitol. Somehow uh, his little uh, craft was not picked up at all, even though different people in Florida tipped off the Secret Service. But because there wasn't a specific time that they could tell him that he was coming, they said there's really nothing they could do about it. He is now in custody, possibly facing federal charges. He said he was there to deliver a message about the need to clean up the campaign financing system. Uh, So, Jim, not only uh, is there a gaping hole in our security, but the media, of course, now focused on that because it's a liberal cause. Whereas if it was a guy who might have been upset about tax day or something, uh, we might have a different narrative going today. 
you make a very strong point there, Greg, which is that if this guy had been doing this to protest taxes or protest government or protest abuses of power or something like that, he would be a dangerous, you know, aspiring terrorist. Uh, but because it's this guy, wow. Remember Granny D? <laughs> yes. Little old lady walking across the country and she was the most inspiring person ever. I walk a lot just to get my DigiWalker, my, you know, my <laughs> Fitbit numbers up. Nobody ever throws a little party for me. Anyway. <laughs> You are correct. It's one of those things where you're watching this and you're thinking, my God, where is that White House drone enthusiast when we need it? <laughs> um, and, and you're right. Somebody pointed out yesterday that, look, this guy may have done it to make a political point. You might kind of remind it of the guy who landed his plane in Red Square back in the 1980s. Next time, it may not be so nice. Next time, it might have somebody with explosives on there or something dangerous or something like that. So we can kind of chuckle about this now, but considering how bad the U.S. Secret Service has been performing lately and how bad the U.S. Capitol Police have been performing lately is another embarrassing black eye to institutions that really don't need them. No, that's exactly right. And if you ever wanted to know what your government thinks about you, today, this is a good week to know because it's tax week. So you know that metaphorically the government has been taking your stuff and violating you uh, when it comes to your finances. But what we've heard from the TSA this week about TSA agents intentionally pulling people aside to to essentially molest them, and then other stories about TSA people stealing stuff from your luggage. Meanwhile, in the past 14 years, they haven't actually stopped a hijacking that we're aware of. Yet the one thing we do want them to do, stop people from flying things into government buildings. Eh. Yeah, that's, that'd be, you'd think that'd be kind of high on the list, right? You know. <laughs> All right, on to the crazy martini now. And for those of you who have listened to this program for nearly five years now, you know that Jim and I don't disagree on much. We've disagreed on tactics related to shutdowns and things like that in the past. But a uh, little bit of a disagreement today in today's crazy martini, because in addition to Hillary Clinton's breathless appearance at the Ohio Chipotle earlier in the week, there's now a discussion about whether or not she should have tipped at Chipotle. Jim believes she should have. Uh, I'm among those who believes that was not necessary. Jim, go ahead and make the case. Well, okay, sure. So there's two observations, and, and I have seen reaction even from folks that I respect, like Exurban John and folks like So here's the thing. So do am I a big tipper? Eh, you know, ask my wait staff. I will point out that when I'm at a place that's got a tip jar, and I get back uh, $2.41 or something like that, I will put the $0.41 cents into the tip jar. I could say that this is a noble gesture on my part because I love the common man and I want to see everybody <laughs> succeed and all that stuff. It really gets down to the fact that I don't like having a pockets full of pennies and nickels at the end of the day. Sure. It's, it reached that point where it's, it, you know, it's too much trouble. It's too much of a pain. I never get around to the bank and put them into the, the rolls of pennies and stuff. And I figure it can do them more good than it can do me. Life has been good to me, et cetera, et cetera. I know there are a bunch of people who don't tip that. And the, the point of the X, John, I assume something to, some of the yours, Greg, look, I'm going up to the place, I'm getting my food on a tray, and I'm taking it back to my table. I eat, then I put the tray away, and I throw the trash away, so it's not like they're even cleaning the table. As somebody put it, if I have to use reading glasses to see the menu up above the server, <laughs> instead of holding the menu in my hand, I don't tip at the place. <laughs> and I suppose... I'm not going to give someone an enormous amount of grief for something like that. I, I you know, people who I don't know if you necessarily need to, to make an enormous gesture of, of making a big tip, whether it's Chipotle or Starbucks or or any place like that that has a tip jar. But the one thing I will note, Greg, you and I, we're not running as a champion of the American people, right? <laughs> we're not running saying, look, I stand up for the little people. I'm the one who cares. And the other thing is, Greg, you know, life's been good to us, but neither you nor I are, have a net worth of $200 million. This is true. So it's not like she can't afford the tip or something like that. So that's my case that, you know, is this, is this, this is not the email servers, although once again, Hillary's in trouble with the server. Uh, <laughs> it, it's not the biggest, although I do kind of feel like this is a, this gets to one of the cores of the Clintons that one is that they're always calling for more generosity with other people's money, not with their own. You don't need a giant federal program. You don't need to get senators to sign on to go. Tipping is something you can do to helping a working person that all it takes is you take money out of your pocket and you put it in there. And it's not, it's not a giveaway. It's not welfare. They've done a job. And if they've done a good job, by golly, give them a good tip to say, hey, good job. I really appreciate what you did for me. Hillary's choice to not do that, it's her choice, but I think it kind of illustrates that her whole thing of I'm the champion of the everyday Americans and ordinary, you know, it's, it's all nonsense because she doesn't choose to do it to make even the most simple gesture of helping the person who are, you know, helping with her burrito bowl. 
Yeah, well, uh, all, all good points. Uh, I, I think the strongest argument is one that you mentioned, that it's not a, a table-side service. You don't have a wait staff and that sort of thing. And that's usually how you uh, end up tipping, uh, you know, 15, 20, sometimes more, depending on the quality of the service. The other thing is, is, is that more and more often, particularly at Chipotle, most people just pay with the card. So, and they don't really give you the opportunity to say, would you like to add a tip to that? It's like an assembly line process. In fact, I was just there last night. You hand them the card, they swipe it, they give you your receipt. It's, it's a very quick process and there's really no expectation uh, of that. I think if you are paying with cash, then, then, then perhaps there's a little more onus on you to do that, particularly if you don't like spare change, which you and I are certainly in agreement on that. So ultimately, I think it does come down to the point that Hillary Clinton being the champion, the working person, is it should have a slightly different perspective coming in there. So it might have certainly looked better for her or at least uh, avoided the conversation that the rest of us are are having today. But something tells me she doesn't carry a lot of cash on her. Overall, I don't think most people, when they go into fast food, whether it's Chipotle or anywhere else, really think too too long and hard about, especially they're doing takeout, uh, leaving anything in the jar since there wasn't actually the, the table side service. So. I will point out you make a fair point. If I use a credit card or, or you know a debit card or something like that, I'm not I'm not going to leave money in the tip jar. And so my entire process of tipping less than a buck is mad, simply a matter of convenience and not choosing to you know carry the coins. Having said that, Hillary did not play with the credit card. She paid with twenty one dollars. Oh, she did. Okay. Yes, and so she had so she got back some amount of coins. The bill was twenty dollars and something cents. So she had coins, and she chose to put that back in her pocket, not into the tip jar. Uh huh. That's where I think she looks astonishingly cheap. She, with her net worth of two hundred dollars and five homes, and you know <laughs> the billions of the Clinton, she needed those thirty-two cents or whatever it was more than the tip. The, the people there. But oh, by the way, the people behind the counter are making like eight twenty-five an hour. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, you know, like, and I'm sure she'll turn around and campaign. We need a higher minimum wage. Okay, Hillary, but you, you had a chance to help these people out. You, it's not just they're not abstract people. They're right there in front of you and putting the guacamole. Maybe she sprung the extra for the guacamole, and that's why she didn't feel like it or something. You, you can do that, but don't run around touting what a great caring person you are uh, if, you're, if you don't tip. That just kind of strikes me as a – my level of tolerance for Hillary's <laughs> not living up to her standards is pretty darn low. I cut her less slack than a lot of other people. Well, as a Midwesterner, I know that she was probably on the Ohio Turnpike. And at the Turnpike, in addition to the restaurants – You've got uh, little games for the kids to play, and one of those is is the grabber. You know where you can get the toys, uh, and they always cheat you out of it, or they, you know, you're you're just about to push that toy over the edge and, and take it yes. out of the the bottom. And she probably feels like she got hosed at a previous rest stop, and she was bound <laughs> and determined to get it at the next one, so she had to keep her quarters. I don't know. Darn you, Pedro of South of the Border! I know you <laughs> See if I enact amnesty now. You know. uh. <laughs> There's an interesting argument to be had about the culture of tipping in the United States, and we can have that argument. I'm just going to observe, don't tell us how much you stand up for the little guy and then not tip. That's my yeah. my, my nutshell argument there. Exactly. And read the jolt today because Jim has a good point about the liberals who leave notes to people that they don't tip because it promotes income inequality because then people don't have to be paid minimum wage and all this sort of thing at restaurants. And it's just a a big old way to make yourself look noble while you're really being super cheap. That was good rant material. That seems to be striking a chord this morning. (laughs) Absolutely. So the the ordinary tight wads, they just don't tip and like, hey, I'm cheap. All right, that's fine. (laughs) You're open about it. No, no, I'm not giving any money because I care because I'm striking (laughs) a blow for. Oh, shut up. (laughs) Good job starting the discussion, Jim. It had to be done, and uh, I can't think of anybody better to do it. So I knew- I'm on a listening to her. <laughs> <laughs> I knew this would be a fun, crazy martini. Have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today, and be sure to tune in again on Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch.